Hosanna, Hosanna, we come to give you all the glory and the honor. Hosanna, Hosanna, we come to give you all the glory and the praise. Prince of peace, mighty God, holy King, the everlasting Father. Him, y'all. Nobody. Come on, y'all. Hosanna, Hosanna. We come to give you all the glory and the honor. Hosanna, Hosanna. We come to give you all the glory and the praise. Prince of peace. Yes. Mighty God. Holy King. The everlasting Father, there is no like hey. you. Nobody like him, y'all. Nobody like him. I see the Lord sitting up on the throne, and the train of his robe fills the temple with glory. And the angels cried, Holy, Holy. see the Lord sitting up on the throne, and the train of his robe fills the temple with glory. And the angels cried, Holy, 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 there is none like you.
It is my pleasure to greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and to welcome you to this uh, time of worship and your point of contact for the kingdom of God. I'm Pastor Duma A. Harshaw, Jr., coming to you from First Baptist Church, located at 101 South Wilmington Street in the capital city of Raleigh, North Carolina, where we believe in God's word and God's presence and God's power. We believe in the saving act of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. And we are children of the resurrection and therefore children of hope. And we believe in the second coming of Christ. And we simply stand on the word of God. And our trust and our faith is in God. And as we gather with those tenets and in that way of believing, we declare according to the word of God that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. According to 2 Timothy 1.7, we stand on the word of God. And so this is a day and age in which it's easy to have lives filled with anxiety and fear, fear, fear and filled with rage and even unhappiness and violent responses to what we see going on. But we believe in the way of Jesus Christ, and that means we believe in the way of love. And God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And we stand on that gospel message that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So welcome to this time. We invite your prayers and your attention. Encourage you to invite a loved one or a family member or a friend uh, to tune in as well. And especially if you know of someone who's going through, who needs to hear a word of encouragement and hope, uh, encourage them to share with you or you share this message with them. People need help today. People need hope today. People need encouragement today. And God has placed you and me uh, in this world in order to bring these things. Come with me to this second uh, letter of the Apostle Paul uh, to Timothy that's found in the New Testament, the first chapter, particularly verses 8 through 10. And from the New International Translation of the text, it says, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Rather, join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. And verse 10, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, the hearing, and the application of his awesome word. Will you join me in a time of prayer? Dear eternal God, our heavenly Father, we are grateful for this hour of worship, this time of celebration, this moment of praise, this time of celebrating your grace. Lord, you've been so good to us better to us than we've been to ourselves. Bless your word to our hearts. Bless your people who have open ears. Bless those who stand in the need of a savior, of experiencing and walking in the light. May your word penetrate their reality and touch them now in a mighty way. Encourage us, Lord. Empower us, Lord. Use us, Lord. And we'll be careful when all is said and done to give your name the praise, and you, of course, have all the glory. In Christ's name we pray, and God's people said, Amen. 
Amen. We come to this second letter of Timothy, and as someone has noted, it indeed is a special and precious treasure that we find in the Bible, and the student of the Bible can rejoice because it contains the last recorded words of the great Apostle Paul. Uh, this uh, last letter of the old, tried, and true missionary, an itinerant preacher uh, of the gospel, probably was written about uh, the summer of 67 AD, almost 35 years after his uh, very dramatic conversion to Christ on the road of Damascus. And 20 years since, uh, the Apostle Paul had embarked on his first missionary journey. And now he finds himself in a Roman prison, which were not like the prisons of our day. There was no air condition, there was no heat. Uh, there are no clean uh, places to abide or inhabit in these awful places. And yet the Apostle Paul was here simply because of his testimony uh, to the reality of Jesus Christ, the power of the resurrection, and proclaiming the gospel truth. And so here from this place, uh, while he awaited his trial and ultimately execution uh, for the sake of Christ, and uh, then he writes these words and encourages this servant of the Lord from a younger generation to be faithful, to have courage, to utilize faith, to teach the truth, to preach the gospel, to remember his heritage, to stir up the spiritual giftedness of his life, to endure suffering, to hold steadfast, to be about boldness for the work that he's doing in the church and in the world for the cause of Christ, and to remain solid and stand upon the foundation that is grounded in discipleship, servanthood to a world in need, and also to continue to lift up and to hold true to his, his testimony. And it's interesting as we come to these first words, uh, the Apostle Paul then utters uh, this phrase and even imperative uh, to the young servant of the Lord, and that is not to live with shame and not to be ashamed of him, his colleague in ministry. We think of shame as feeling a sense of disgrace, uh, embarrassment, sometimes remorse, even sometimes guilt. And someone has noted that shame is a, is a negative feeling about oneself because of one's involvement in an activity that is considered unacceptable by the society to which the person belongs. And this negative feeling is also sometimes caused by one's relationship to a person whose behavior is considered unacceptable by society. Usually such a feeling results with the withdrawal, withdrawal from the unacceptable person or at least denial of relationship to that person and denial of any involvement in the unacceptable activity. And of course it is uh, very apropos for Timothy then to be encouraged not to live in a place of shame. And uh, it's very easy for Timothy to be ashamed of being associated with the Apostle Paul at this time in this larger society. Uh, Paul, who was at that time a prisoner in jail, doing time, an inmate, and also to associate uh, with one who was giving witness and testimony uh, to the reality of Jesus Christ. As some saw Christ as simply a dead rabbi, others saw him as the Son of God. And obviously, he was unpopular in the larger society in the non-Christian and hostile environment of this day and this time. And so Paul commends uh, Timothy, and he even commands him, if you will, uh, and utters to him 
the imperative to not be ashamed. And that did not imply that Timothy was already ashamed as it had been noted and needed to cease uh, from such shame uh, related to the Apostle Paul. Uh, but a New Testament uh, uh, scholar has said the use of the Greek aorist tense suggests that at present Timothy was not ashamed but Paul wanted such shame never to begin in his heart and in his mind. Uh, and, but he realized the possibility that, that he could begin to live in this kind of reality if he were not careful. And to sense uh, that here in the company of this inmate, this apostle Paul, this prisoner, that then his own credibility would suffer and he would simply withdraw from fellowship from the Apostle Paul. And what a marvelous notion that is to live without shame. And, and we ought to utter it to our society today in, in so many ways. No shame, no shame to stand up for what is right. No shame to stand up for the least of these and the most vulnerable in our society. Uh, no shame to support the students who fall behind in their studies, who are often overlooked. No shame to reach out to those who are less popular, who have uh, few or no followers. No shame to admit in your own life that you need help and you need support in whatever form that that might take. No shame to acknowledge mental health issues when they are yours. No shame to admit that family members and loved ones are among those who are the incarcerated and doing time for crimes that they allegedly have committed. No shame to own up, even as a child of God, to your own weakness and your own failures. No shame to stand on the wall, to call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ as you utter your prayers. No shame, no apology for the fact that you are numbered with those who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. No shame to say to a broken and violent world that you believe in the methodology of love to solve the ills of our world. No shame to say that you are one who follows the Prince of Peace, that you are one indeed who believes not only in Jesus who died on the cross, but in the resurrected Lord who one day will come again. No shame when you lift up the gospel of Jesus Christ and, and tell people about the goodness of the Lord and the possibility that God has provided if they would just surrender their heart and their, their heart and their lives to the Lord. No shame in coming to places of worship and celebrating the presence of the Holy Spirit and the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. No shame to say that you consult God when you make big decisions in your life about who you will walk with for a lifetime about the vocation that you will commit your gifts and your energy to. No shame when you decide that you will bear the cross of Christ and be identified with suffering and allow God's presence and God's power to see you through. That is, in essence, what the Apostle Paul was saying to this young servant. And in particular, don't be ashamed of the gospel message. Don't be ashamed of your testimony or mine. And according to society, I am a criminal in this environment. But you know that if I'm a prisoner, the only prisoner uh, that I am is a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know that I've not harmed anyone or stolen from anyone or did any disruption in society, and yet I'm considered a criminal. But I will take that as my lot, as I simply suffer for the Lord Jesus Christ. 
I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, of the Lord who died on an old rugged cross. I'm not ashamed to say that that same Jesus lives and he lives in my heart and he lives in my life. No shame to say that one day I will see him face to face. One day that God's victory will be won and God's kingdom established. No shame. And so he says to Timothy, remember that even in the context where you find me today, I am your brother in Christ. And I know you know that, Timothy, Paul could probably say, because Timothy was a young servant of loyalty and devotion and discipleship and did not step away from his loyalty to this apostle and this mentor in his life. But Paul is saying, with all the pressure around you and all that's going on in society around you, just in case I needed to encourage you to keep on keeping on with the Lord, keep on giving your testimony, keep telling your story, keep telling how you got over it, keep singing your song of Zion, keep preaching the gospel of truth, keep reaching out to those who are lost, Keep lifting up your head in the midst of your journey. Even though you're young, do not allow them to indict you for that. But simply stand on the gospel message and realize that you are joining with me in the sufferings of the Lord Jesus Christ. We suffer for the gospel's sake. And anybody who would speak out truth to power in this day and age and speak the truth of human dignity and the value of human rights and protecting the least of these in our world and in our environment today will then often be stigmatized by shame and reproach and rejection. But there's no shame in looking out for those who have no one else to look out for them. There's no shame in speaking up for what is just and what is righteous. Uh, there's no shame in, in lifting up an issue about injustice and about the greed of capitalism and how it destroys human lives and the imbalance in our nation about the haves and the have-nots and the source of that reality. There's no shame in that. There's no shame in telling people how you got over because God has been so good to you. The Lord has answered your prayer. No shame in seeing prayer as a primary resource uh, for helping you with your issues in your own life and in the lives of those you love. And even though you see professionals as doctors and medical people, you still know that there's another doctor whose name is Jesus Christ. And even though you walk into courtrooms with attorneys and judges in that environment, there's another judge that sits high. There's another advocate on your side. There's another standard uh, that's bigger than whatever is happening in your circumstance, in my circumstance, in your context, in my context, in your city, and in your space, and your place, that there's something greater that's transcendent that looks down on, on us. Somebody said, God sits high, but he looks low. He is always engaged in what concerns us. There's no shame in believing that God will make a way out of no way. There's no shame in waiting for God to fix it and to bring things together while you work and work, trusting in the goodness of the Lord and what he is able to do. And so in this passage, the apostle underscores the reality that this young servant is not fighting in his own strength. He's not given the testimony simply from his own resources, but there's another power, and it's the power of Almighty God. It says, by the power of God, and that's how ministry is done in a broken world. We have money, and we have education, and we have experience, and we have titles, and we have people resources, but yet there's a God who is able to bring all of that together and move in a mighty way. It's by the power of God you got over. It's not because of your brilliance. It's not because of your education. It's not because of your family DNA. But it's because God made a way for you. He woke you up this morning with your mind stayed on him. 
He made a way for you. He delivered you. He has forgiven us. He has restored us. He has given, a, given us a life and a destiny that this world cannot take away because the world has not given to us. And so those in ministry need to understand with all the preparation that you go through, you've got to get on your knees and call on that name that is above every name. There's no committee. There's no board. There's no group. Uh, there's no people who can deliver you. Your deliverance comes from the hand of God. And sometimes we look at books and we download uh, information and, and we look at what somebody else says and all of that is part of education and we need that. But at the end of the day, you need to call on God and know that that's where your help comes from. It comes from the Lord in order to keep preaching the gospel, teaching the truth, giving your testimony, working in mission, ministering to the needs of people, helping those who cannot help themselves, reaching for those who lag behind, for those that the world has scurried on and forgotten about. And everything is fine as long as you're the star that everybody wants you to be. But if anything goes wrong in that, the world can discard you uh, like your tomorrow's trash. And yet we know that God is present and the Lord says, no shame. I am with you, never to leave you, nor forsake you. You are mine. Your life is bigger than these circumstances, and I can see you through. And then he goes on in the ninth verse to say exactly that in another way. And it says, again, as we back up to verse 8, so do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me his prisoner, rather join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and because of his own grace. Grace will see you through. Why do you think someone penned amazing grace? How sweet the sound. That's because grace is what God has provided in every circumstance. That's why you have the strength you have today. That's why you're still here. That's why there's work that still remains for you. That's why you have a sense of joy in your heart and in your life. It's grace. It's God's power. It's God's love. It's God's goodness. He saved us even from ourselves. And he called us to be about our Father's business in the world today, to be helping somebody in the name of Jesus Christ and not just to help ourselves. One of the deficits of being in a capitalistic empire that we live in is that we're more concerned about us than we are about others. It's more about how we get over what's good for us rather than what's good for everyone else. That's why we can't rise above the pandemic because people forgot about others when they thought about themselves only and what they were comfortable with and what they had chosen to do. And so we can't shake it. And maybe it's not over yet simply because people cannot get themselves and get other oriented rather than me oriented and mine oriented and what I want and my freedom and my individual happiness. But oh, thanks be to God that when he calls us and saves us, when he ministers to our needs, that then we're about others. Just like Jesus illustrated in the parable of the Good Samaritan. When are you going to be concerned about somebody other than yourself? When are you going to be concerned about the other children in the neighborhood that aren't yours? When are you going to be concerned about those people you and I point at and talk about? When are you going to be concerned about the others that aren't as blessed as you are when you go to sleep at night? But then the gospel calls us to another kind of living. And ministry for the kingdom's sake calls us to another kind of living. And that's the only thing perhaps that can save our nation and perhaps the world is that we get away from greed and you know, selfishness, self-centeredness, self-gratification and begin to be concerned about the larger community, the other folk, 
who don't have it the way you have it, the other people who haven't yet succeeded, and then we'll see a difference. That's grace that God has given us, not because of anything we have done. We don't deserve it, but it comes anyway. And then it goes on in that last verse and it says, this grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. You were chosen by God before you were even born to experience God's grace and love in your life. But it has now been revealed God's plan for your life, your destiny, mine, has now been revealed through the pen of our Savior, Christ Jesus. And look what he did for us. He destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. That's why we preach the gospel. There's a whole lot of other things we can preach, but we preach the gospel because there is life, and there is light, and there is love, and there is everlasting abiding in the presence of God. Amen? <clears throat> Amen, indeed. If you have not yet surrendered your heart to Christ, this could be your day of salvation. This could be your new beginning. This could be the work of miracle in your life right now. This could be the breakthrough. This could be the shifting of the paradigm, the new beginning. This could be your way through. And this could be life everlasting with the Lord Jesus Christ. And all you need to do is say yes to him. God has already done the preparatory work. Jesus has already died on the cross. God has already made the way. And now all we need to do is invite him into our hearts, into our lives. And you can do that on your own by simply calling on him, asking him to come in, forgive you, and then to walk with you, to love you, to be your savior, to be your guide, to be your redeemer. You'll never be the same. And then you will embrace what Jesus promised as the abundant life. The abundant life. And that's more than money. That God can bless you with that too. But that's more than money. It's beyond anything like fame. It's beyond anything like power. But it's being part of divine reality and being part of God's family. And that's for you and that's for me. Let us pray together. Dear Lord, we thank you for salvation. We thank you for overcoming shame. We thank you for overcoming embarrassment. We thank you for the ongoing journey with you that brings life and peace and happiness. Bless those under the sound of my voice. Minister to our needs and minister to mine. Let us surrender, let me surrender to your will and your way. And we will give your name praise. In Christ's name we pray. And God's people said, amen. God bless you.
love. It's such a blessing to see you again and to be here. I'm so very grateful for the opportunity to get rest and renewal and to have a vacation period. I want to thank uh, the members and the leaders of First Baptist Church for that opportunity for the time to rest and renew during the month of July. And thank you so much for your support for the family and also your prayer support inspired by our leadership that does such a phenomenal job all year long in doing the time that the pastor is away. I uh, would like to simply <clears throat> take this time to celebrate with those who have had birthdays in July and August and those upcoming in August and uh, uh, we will have a time of prayer and in that prayer we include all of our sick and shut in and all of the needs of the church uh, your needs uh, as well. And the scripture I'd like to share with you before we begin it comes from Lamentations, the third chapter, verses 22 and 23. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Amen indeed. And uh, we celebrate and say happy birthday to all of the July babies as I, as I was away. Uh, Mary Peebles on July 4th. <clears throat> Deacon Ellis Jones on July 8th. Deacon Elizabeth Clarkson July 9th. Dr. Joyce Hilliard Clark on July the 11th, Reverend Joseph Briggs on July 14th, Brother Glenn Wood Johnson on July 21st, Sister Patricia Howard on July 21st, Sister Pearly Gale on July 23rd, Deaconess Zedia Carson on July 25th, Clarice Miller Edwards on July 26th, Deborah, Sister Deborah Broyles on July 27th, and also congratulations to Brother and Sister Albert and Joyce Mann on their 59th wedding anniversary on July the 6th. And for August, we are grateful for Sister Lucille P. Lee on August the 5th, and Deaconess Ora May. Jones on July, on August uh, 5th, and Sister Margaret Lane on August 14th, and Trustee Delphine Bullock on August 18th. We will add to those as those uh, notifications come in for our next newsletter. And special congratulations also to Dr. Ulysses and Sister Margaret Lane for their 50th wedding anniversary coming up August 14th. Amen. God is good. Amen. The Lord has watched over us. And we celebrate the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Now let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for these you blessed to see another birthday for July and for August thus far. We thank you for these wedding anniversaries and those who have been kept together by your love and their love for one another so many decades. Bless them. Renew them in their love and renew all married couples in the life of our church and bless all of our sick and our shut-in members and those who stand in need of a miracle today, those who stand in need of healing today, those who stand in need of comfort today in the loss of loved ones and those who are in any trouble way. We pray for them. We pray for families. We pray for our children. We pray for our youth. We pray for our young adults. And we pray for our middle adults. And we pray for our seniors today that you would bless them in a mighty way. Bless our church is our prayer. And every member of this congregation, oh God, renew us in our faith. Establish us in the ways of the Lord. Protect us, oh Lord. Heal us. Be with us, and we will be careful to give your name praise and 
you have all the glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you. So we say together, having been led as we believe by the Spirit of God to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior and on the profession of our faith, having been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, we do now in the presence of God, angels in this assembly, most solemnly and joyfully enter into covenant with one another as one body in Christ. We engage, therefore, by the aid of the Holy Spirit, to walk together in Christian love, to strive for the advancement of this church in knowledge and holiness, to give it a place in our affections, prayers and services above every organization of human origin, to sustain its worship, ordinances, discipline and doctrine, to contribute cheerfully and regularly as God has prospered us towards its expenses for the support of a faithful and evangelical ministry among us, the relief of the poor, and the spread of the gospel throughout the world. In case of difference of opinion in the church, we will strive to avoid a contentious spirit, and if we cannot unanimously agree, we will cheerfully recognize the right of the majority to govern. We also engage to maintain family and secret devotion, to study diligently the word of God, to religiously educate our children, to seek the salvation of our kindred and acquaintance, to walk circumspectly in the world, to be kind and just to those in our employ, and faithful in the service we promise others, endeavoring in the purity of heart and goodwill towards all men to exemplify and commend our holy faith. We further engage to watch over, to pray for, to exhort and stir up each other until every good word and work, to guard each other's reputation, not needlessly exposing the infirmities of others, to participate in each other's joys, and with tender sympathy, bear one another's burdens and sorrows, to cultivate Christian courtesy, to be slow to give or take offense, but always ready for reconciliation, being mindful of the rules of the Savior in the 18th chapter of Matthew, to secure it without delay and through life amid evil report and good report to seek to live for the glory of God who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. When we remove from this place, we engage as soon as possible to unite with some other church where we can live out the spirit of this covenant and the principles of God's word. Amen. We're told according to the the same night of which Christ was betrayed, he spent intimate time with his disciples. And during the meal, he took the bread from the table and he broke it and instructed them, this represents my body, which is given for you. And then at some place in the meal, he took the cup and he said, the cup represents the new
Testament, the new covenant established in the blood of the Lamb. And he said, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show forth the Lord's death until he come again. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for symbols of life and new life. Thank you for the wherewithal to confess our brokenness, our needs, even our sins. And thank you, Lord, for your forgiving love. Thank you for your redeeming love. Thank you for the blood of the Lamb. And thank you for restoration and health and transformation, change. And thank you for a second chance. And thank you for new beginnings. Bless these emblems and the new life that is connected to them. And we'll be careful to give your name praise. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We now hold in our hands a reminder of suffering servant. He suffered that we might be healed. Let us commune together. And now we hold the fruit of the vine. We thank God for the blood of the lamb. The solution to sin and brokenness is Jesus Christ. Thank God for Jesus. Let us commune together. Amen. We're told in the word that after that rich fellowship in that upper room that they sung a hymn there, they departed and they changed the world. Let us do likewise. Let us please stand. God be with you until we meet again. God bless you.